One of the things that's easy to forget when regarding video games as an industry and a medium is just how young it is compared to its fellow major market art forms. We might have learned to paint before we learned to talk. Music? Who even knows? We've been writing books since before we had paper. Movies? Okay, those are barely over a century old, but theater is ancient. Video games, though? Video games only date to roughly the early 1960s, oddly enough slightly earlier than their seemingly lower-tech cousin, the tabletop RPG. I mean, wow, only just over half a century. The medium still practically has its baby teeth. Almost makes me want to forgive it for still pooping its pants all the time. I mean, I don't, but I kind of want to. In any case, you know what the gaming press thusly has comparatively less experienced writing than the chronicles of other media de art? Obituaries. But man, did we ever have to write one last Thursday. On September 19th, 2013, we lost Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo from 1949 to 2002, and most famously, the man who dictated its transformation from a playing card company to an electronic entertainment producer. And, as the man who signed off on Gunpei Yokoi's Game & Watch creations, expanded his family's company reach into Western markets, said yes to Shigeru Miyamoto's Donkey Kong concept, and commissioned the creation of what would become the Famicom and Nintendo Entertainment System, was both the final mastermind behind pushing some of the most iconic devices, characters, and franchises in the history of the medium into visibility and the driving force behind the revolution that brought home video games back from the dead. In other words, it's not just that had Yamauchi not one day decided that Nintendo should transition into an electronic toy manufacturer, gaming would look completely different today. It's possible gaming as we know it wouldn't exist at all. I mean, look around you. This video is running on a website dedicated to video games. Would any of this be here? So, yeah. Big deal. The end of an era. Hell, the end of an epic. And yet, it didn't seem to rate quite the outpouring of loss and grief that greeted, say, the passing of other nerd culture icons, like Steve Jobs two years ago, Gene Roddenberry in 1991, or Jim Henson a year before that. Some of that, to be sure, is about the image side of corporate entertainment entities. The difference between being the head of a beloved company and being the face. Hiroshi Yamauchi was the boss of Nintendo, but to the popular culture, the company remains personified alternately by Mario or his creator, Shigeru Miyamoto. But the somewhat, well, muted response could also have a lot to do, fairly or not, with reputation. Whereas the mentioned Miyamoto is by all accounts that rare creative professional whose real persona actually matches his whimsical Willy Wonka public image, Yamauchi was, well, whimsical would not have been the word. It's hard to read any history of the way he actually conducted himself in business and not have the word ruthless spring immediately to mind. The Japanese media and his corporate colleagues often depicted him as imperial or dictatorial, while Western accounts like David Chef's infamous Game Over essentially rendered him the perfect stereotype of the stoic, sinister Japanese corporate overlord that was making American economists crap their pants in the 80s and 90s. He also wasn't exactly known for his deep ties to the gaming community itself. Despite having final say on pretty much every game and device that Nintendo put out during their golden age, he didn't actually play or even like video games very much himself. It's one of those inescapable facts of any fandom. It costs money to make the things we love, and the business of doing business is a dirty, eh, business. So more often than not, there's at least one guy behind the scenes who's vital to the process, but you might not like them very much if you knew them personally. We all know this, but it's not always easy to acknowledge. American culture in particular places an absurd amount of faith in the myth of the benevolent capitalist, and has an equally absurd need to see its corporate and industrial vanguards not only as successful, but heroic. Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, Steve Jobs. Our collective imaginations are littered with men who cast themselves as modern-day Merlins, only to later be revealed as flawed and human as the rest of us. Except maybe Edison. That dude was just evil. This need is so strong that it occasionally ends up creating its own backlash. Today, long-running jokes about bigotry and anti-Semitism on the part of Walt Disney are commonplace, but there's actually very little evidence to suggest he was significantly more racist than most men of his time, which is to say, probably still pretty racist by today's standards, yes. But while it's easy to scoff at, say, the trite cultural caricatures of It's a Small World today, it really seems he believed in the underlying message of a unified world it's trying to convey, however awkwardly he might have imagined it. He was a calculating, success-at-any-cost businessman, but also a committed futurist who believed that science and technology had not only the ability but the duty to improve the common good. He codified the rose-colored nostalgia view of a homogenized Main Street USA utopian past, yes, but also largely divorced it from the religiosity that had underlain similar myth-making of the time, ensuring that while the Disney world might have been a sanitized corporate fluff entity, at least it was sanitized corporate fluff for everybody. It's a response that's at once baffling but also quintessentially human, faced with the realization that Uncle Walt was not the paragon of goodness he cultivated as a persona and forced to reassess our image of him as a result, we'd apparently prefer to reimagine him as a paragon of evil rather than the more complicated truth that he was neither wholly good nor wholly bad but, well, complicated like most people are. I raise the specter of Walt Disney because honestly that's really who Yamauchi would have been gaming's answer to. I know Miyamoto is often granted that title, the Walt Disney of video games, but in this analogy Miyamoto is closer to Ube Evarks, Walt's friend and one-time partner who created Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and Mickey Mouse. See, these were both men who may not have been their own company's creative driving forces, but they were the visionaries, the guys who could look at a cartoon mouse and think, that mouse could conquer the world. Or at then-humble engineer Gunpei Yokoi's homemade Ultra Hand toy and think, I'm gonna reorient my entire family company around that. Guys who looked at mediums in their infancy and demanded they evolved into forms no one had ever dared to imagine. Were they, at the end, good men? I imagine that's up to their friends and families to say, quite frankly. But great men? 
History, the history of a modern world practically wallpapered in their respective accomplishments, would seem to leave little doubt of that. It's always a mistake to make gods out of men, yes, but it's equally wrong to make devils. We shouldn't deify people just because they made the things we love, true, but we also shouldn't be ready to write them off just because they don't live up to their deification. I never met Hiroshi Yamauchi. I don't know what kind of person he was, but I need only look around my home, at my career, or into my own memories to know that my life was better and happier because of things he set in motion, and I know for a fact that I am not alone. And thus, no, I don't think there's anything wrong or inappropriate in saying that I'm sorry to see him go, that this should be mourned, and that his passing is a tremendous loss for all of gaming. Guemifuku wo inorimasu, Yamochi-sama.